Tonight we're going to be looking at uh, David dances before the ark in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And we're going to look at the entire chapter. That's 23 verses. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6 verses 1 to 23. 2 Samuel chapter 6 verses 1 to 23. And uh, before we begin, before we dig into that particular chapter, we're going to open up in a word of prayer. So let us pray. Lord, we are blessed to be here tonight. You've watched over us and protected us and provided for us and helped us, Lord, throughout this day. We praise you, O oh God, because you gave us the precious gift of salvation. It's in you, Lord that we live, move, and have our very being. And Lord, we pray tonight for all the brothers and sisters that we have in this body who are convalescing at home, either on our prayer and concern list. We just pray for their healing tonight. Pray, Lord, for your presence and your comfort in their lives. We pray, Lord, our hearts still go out to those families, Lord, on the West Coast who are dealing with fires on the West Coast and floods on the East Coast, even floods down in the southern United States. We all, Lord, are still dealing with this pandemic that is impacting not only the United States, but countries all over the world. So, Lord, we just pray that you help us to keep the faith, increase our faith to trust you during tough times as these. We pray, Lord, as we study your word tonight, that you would open up the eyes of our hearts, that you would let the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. We bless you, Lord, tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, 2 Samuel chapter 6. We'll begin reading. I'm going to read from the NASB tonight, but this is what the Word of God says. Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Bale Judah, by L.A. Judah to bring up from there the ark of God which is called by the name the very name of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned above the cherubim they placed the ark of God on a new cart they might bring it from the house of Abinadab which was on the hill and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made fir wood and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals but when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen nearly upset it and the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah and God struck him down there for his irreverence and he died there by the ark of God David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. And that place was called Perez Uzzah to this day. So David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Getite. Thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed, 
Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. Now it was told, King David said, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom into the city of David with gladness. And so it was that when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David that Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent where David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished his offering, the burnt offering and the peace offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Further, he distributed to all the people to all the multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. But when David returned to bless his household, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said how the king of Israel dis distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servants, maids, as one of the foolish ones shamely uncovers himself. So David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will be more lightly esteemed than this and will be humble in my own eyes, but with the maids of whom you have spoken, with them I will be distinguished. Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Amen. Amen. So David dances before the ark. You know, when I was a child, I don't know about y'all, but when I was a child, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother. And when I would be over at my grandmother's house, my grandmother had a bed, as most people do, right? <laughs> But in front of this bed, my grandmother had this wooden chest. A wooden chest that was called a cedar chest. And in this particular cedar chest, she would keep all kinds of personal belongings in this cedar chest. And Every now and then, I would get a glimpse of her opening up this chest to bring out certain items in times of need. And in the text before us today, we have another chest of sorts. Not a cedar chest, but the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was made of acacia wood. It was plated with gold. And it had a mercy seat on the top with two cherubs that faced each other looking down towards the mercy seat. And if you read Exodus chapter 25, we're not going to read it tonight, but Exodus chapter 25 verses 10 to 16, you will find there the dimensions of the ark. 
Because God told Moses to build the ark. But another thing that we need to understand about the Ark of the Covenant is we have to distinguish it from the other two arks that are mentioned in Scripture. You all probably know of one, Noah's Ark. You know the song that we sing, Who Built the Ark? Noah, Noah, who built the ark? Brother Noah built the ark. Don't be, I ain't corny. I'm not corny. I'm just saying that's how the song go. In, <laughs> in Genesis chapter 6, we see that God told Noah to build an ark. And the ark was a symbol of God's protection. But then... There was the ark that Moses was found in by Pharaoh's daughter in Exodus chapter 2. It came on the backdrop of Pharaoh giving a command for all the Hebrew boys to be killed. So what happened is, is Moses' mother got word of what Pharaoh had commanded to the midwives because the midwives ultimately end up saying to Pharaoh that the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. You know, before we can even get there, they've already given birth. So we have infanticide even going back to the Old Testament. But anyway, Moses' mother she knew what Pharaoh's command was, so she built the little ark of sorts, a little chest, and she sent it up the river. And Moses' sister watched the ark as it traveled up the river. And who sees Moses' little ark traveling up the river? It's Pharaoh's daughter. And so Pharaoh's daughter picks up the ark, sees that Moses is a beautiful child. And you know what she does? She ends up handing Moses back to his mother to raise him. Yeah. You talk about God's preservation. Yeah. That's what that particular ark stood for. So Noah's ark, God's protection. Moses' ark, God's preservation. But when we come to the ark of the covenant, what we have is God's provision. God's provision. The ark was, the ark of the covenant was a reminder of God's provision because of the contents. If you go with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. It tells us in, in verse 4. What the contents were. Hebrews 9. And verse 4. It tells us exactly what the contents were. And I'm going to start actually at verse 3. Because it says, behind the second veil, talking about the tabernacle here, because that's where the Ark of the Covenant was, in the tabernacle. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was one, a golden jar holding the manna, that's provision. Two, Aaron's rod which budded, that's provision. And three, the tables of the covenant, that is provision. 
And verse 5 says, And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot speak in detail. So you had three items in there. You had the gold pot of manna, this urn filled with manna. And you know, after the children of Israel were brought out of bondage in Egypt, they began to wander in the wilderness. And it wasn't very long before they were brought out of Egypt that they began to grumble and complain. God delivered them out of Egypt, but they were still complaining. And so, God gives them manna. What is it? It's almost like the original pronunciation of sin. It's like, what is it? What is it? It was like uh, angel cake food, you know, little wafers, so to speak. And God provided them food to eat because they were reasoning in their minds that, you know what, we had it better in Egypt. And what that lets us know is that even when God delivers us sometimes, you can take us out of Egypt but you can't take the Egypt out of us. So God provided them with manna. Provided them with food to eat. And I want you all to know tonight that God is still in the providing business. He is still Jehovah Jireh, our provider. But then there was Aaron's staff that had budded. And what had happened is, is uh, around the 16th, 17th chapter of Numbers, there was a revolt of sorts that was led by a person by the name of Korah. Korah and his company of followers, they felt like they needed to be in authority instead of Aaron. And so what God does is... God says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to set Aaron's staff up and Korah's staff up. And they came back, and you go to number 17, and you'll see that it was Aaron's staff that had budded, which was the indication that God had provided Aaron and the the Levites, so to speak, to be the spiritual leaders of the group or the children of Israel. So God provides godly leadership. But then there was, again, for review, there was the pot of man. There was Aaron's staff that had budded. But then there was also the tablets, the Ten Commandments. And you all know what happened. Moses was communing with God and he came down from the mountain and he saw that uh, they were engaging in uh, idolatry. If you look at Exodus chapter 32, when he saw the idolatry of his people, Exodus 32 and 19, when he saw the idolatry of his people, he was so angry. He was so angry that uh, he threw the first set on the ground. But then when we go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, we see that God told Moses to chisel out some additional ones. Two more tablets of stone like the first ones. And he was to put those in chests. And so the Ten Commandments 
are God's provision to us. And somebody may ask, well, why are God's Ten Commandments provision for us? Well, he provides us a way to be able to know him, to know his will, and to know his ways. So, if the contents of the ark are a reminder of God's provision. The ark itself is a reminder of God's provision as well, but not only that, but God's presence. His presence. Because if you come back to 2 Samuel, Chapter 6, and you look at the first two verses, his presence, it was a sign that God was with them because David gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. 2 Samuel 6, and verse 1 and verse 2, it says, And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baale, Judah, to bring up from there, the ark of God, watch this right here, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord, all caps, of hosts, who is a throne, enthroned above the cherub. It's a visible sign that God was with them. I mean, when they were in the wilderness wanderings, they were nomadic people. And when they were wandering in the wilderness, they had the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day is a visible sign of God's presence. They got the Ark of the Covenant as a visible sign of God's presence. So the Ark represented the presence of God because the Ark of the Covenant was God's footstool. That's what David calls it in 1 Chronicles 28 and 2. Let's go there. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and 2. Let's look. I'm going to start at verse 1. And then y'all can catch up to verse 2. <laughs> <laughs> now David assembled in Jerusalem all the, all the officials of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and the commanders of the divisions that served the king and the commanders of the thousands and the commanders of the hundreds and the overseers of all the property and livestock belonging to the king and his sons with the officials and the mighty men, even all the valiant men. And here it is, verse 2. Then King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my brother, my people. I had intended to build a permanent home for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. So I made preparations to build, but God said to me, this is verse 3, you shall not build a house for my name because you are a man of war and have shed blood. But the point I was trying to make is the Ark of the Covenant was... God's footstool. It was his footstool which points to the fact that God is a sovereign ruler. He is a king and kings sit on thrones and God has not abdicated his throne. Jesus has not abdicated his throne and kings when they sit on their thrones they have footstools. We know that even as we look at the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant points ultimately to Jesus Christ. Because Christ provides. We have the provision of Christ. We have the presence of Christ. He's called 
Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And so in times of need, we need to look to Jesus. Look what the writer of Hebrews tells us. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. In verse 2, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. See, the only race that the Bible talks about is yeah. the Christian race that we're running that is set before us. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. The author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, as David says in 1 Chronicles 28, the ark is his footstool. It's also Christ's footstool as well. So, the ark is a reminder of God's provision, his presence. But number three, the ark is a reminder of the peril that, that comes to those who do not regard God as being holy. The peril that comes to those who do not regard God as being holy. And this is in a large portion, verses 3 to 11, when they began to come up with this fancy idea of how they were going to transport the ark. It says they, they placed the ark of God on a new cart. <laughs> you know, they came up with something fresh. Something new. Something new and improved. A, a new cart. So here they are. They celebrate. The party is going on. It's getting festive, you know. The worship is high. They're celebrating. They had just defeated the Philistines. If you go back to chapter 5, they defeated the Philistines and they bring the ark back to the city of David. They bring it back to Jerusalem. There was music. People were probably yelling and shouting, you know. That's the reason I always tell you, it probably looked like uh, the way uh, Cardinal Stadium looks like pregame, you know. I always tell y'all that the world has not forgot how to shout for its gods. Because if you go out to Cardinal Stadium before a football game, pre-game, the pre-game, they out there getting warmed up before the game even starts. So here they are with David. And all of a sudden, Uzzah decides to stretch out his hand because he sees something going wrong there. Man, he's looking, he's standing back, he's looking, he's like, man, something's getting ready. This thing's getting ready to tip over. So he reaches out his hand to try to keep the ark from stumbling or falling over. And then the music stops. Music stops. Uzzah is dead. And he didn't die of natural causes either. Uzzah is dead because the text says Yahweh's anger burned against him. Yahweh struck him down. It goes against our sensibilities, doesn't it? When we think of God. I mean, well, after all, we like to think of God as being what? Loving, gentle, mm -hmm. seven pounds, 11 mm -hmm. ounces, little bundle of joy, 
in the manger, little baby Jesus. We create gods of our own imagination. And the God of Scripture sometimes is so far from the gods that we create with our own imagination. Because we ask in a situation like this, why would God do this to us? Us was just trying to help. He was trying to do a good thing. I mean, God is being too harsh in this situation is what we would say according to our modern sensibilities, wouldn't we? Lighten up, God. Lighten up, Yahweh. Lighten up, Jesus. I mean, you're going against our preferences. <laughs> and we see this most noticeably during modern day worship, don't we? Somebody coming up with some new idea, some pragmatic idea to get people into worship. Because you know how it goes in most churches. All we call, all we care about is what? Nickels and noses. <laughs> and we reason in our minds with this new method that if it's drawing more nickels and it's drawing more noses then it must be of God. That's the pragmatism at work. You know, it doesn't make a difference if it lines up with Scripture. The only thing that matters is, it's working. It's getting more people. It's getting more money. So it must be of God. But everything new and so-called improved doesn't line up with the Word of God. Because this is what God is teaching us here tonight. He, he's teaching us and reminding us that, that worship is not about what we want. And we have to be reminded of that truth over and over and over and over and over again. Worship is not about what we want. Worship is about what God wants. And we must understand that God had given specific instructions as to how the ark was to be handled. He gave instructions. Go with me to Numbers. Numbers chapter 4. verses 4 to 6. I'm going to jump around in 4 a little bit. But in Numbers chapter 4, it says, in verse 4, it says, this is the work of the descendants of Kohath in the tent of meeting concerning the most holy things. And the Lord was speaking to Moses and Aaron here. Verse 5, when the camp sets out, Aaron and his son shall go and they shall take down the veil of the screen and cover the ark of the testimony with it. And they shall lay a covering of purpose skin on it and shall spread it over it a cloth. And shall spread over it a cloth of pure blue and shall insert its poles. Do you see poles? What are poles? Poles means that this ark was not to be placed on a cart. No matter how new and improved the cart may have been, God prescribed poles, which means that the ark had to be carried, and carried not just by anybody, Let's look at verse 15. Same chapter. Because it says, When Aaron and his sons had finished covering the holy objects and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is to set out after that, the sons of Kohath 
shall come to carry them so that they will not touch the holy objects and die. These are the things in the tent of meeting which the sons of Kohath are to carry. And so he gives instruction that the sons of Kohath were to carry the holy objects. They were not even to look at the objects or touch the objects. What did Uzzah do? With their new and improved method. He reached out to touch. God gives instructions from his word. And God expects for his instructions to be followed. Amen. God does not want us cutting corners with worship. Or cutting corners on the word. Or trying to cut across the field with the word. God wants his instructions to be followed. See, they were trying to be pragmatic. But pragmatism will lead a whole lot of people into peril. Y'all remember Nadab and Abihu, don't you? Read, when you get a chance, Leviticus chapter 10, the first three verses. They tried to offer some strange fire, some unauthorized fire to God. What happens? Yahweh strikes them down. And he sends a message. He says, I must be regarded as being holy. And the problem with our modern day worship is the people of God, we, as the people of God, we all fall into this mindset where we just flippantly go through the motions of worship and we try to cut corners with worship. And we do this to our own peril sometimes without recognizing that worship is about regarding God as being holy. God must be recognized and regarded and reverenced as being holy. So one, the ark represented God's provision. Two, his presence. Three, it reminded us, or reminded them and us, that God must be regarded as holy. And four, the ark is a reminder that God's purpose is to bless his people and not destroy his people. God lays all this down to bless us and not to destroy us. God purposes to bless his people and not destroy us. Look at verses 12 to 23. We're not going to read it again, but when you look at verses 12 to 23, you see that, especially in verse 12, after the, after the ark was taken to Obed-Edom's house, those in the, that's those in the previous verses up above verse 12, but the ark was taken to Obed-Edom's house. Obed-Edom was being blessed. Not only was Obed-Edom being blessed, but his entire household was being blessed. And so what probably motivated David to return the ark to, to Jerusalem after about three months is that he saw somebody getting blessed. He saw Obed-Edom getting blessed. And we don't even know why. You know, a lot of these Charismatic preachers, you know, they'll, they'll say a lot of different stuff, you know, to get some money out of your pocket to tell you why Obed-Edom was blessed. But the, the scripture doesn't necessarily say why Obed-Edom was blessed. We don't know why God blessed Obed-Edom, why while the presence or the Ark of the Covenant was with him. But what we do know is God allows the sun to shine on the just as well as the unjust. And, and what really matters is David learned... God's purpose of blessing 
and not destroying him by witnessing how God blessed Obed-Edom. And y'all know, you can read this in your spare time, but there is a parallel account in 1 Chronicles chapter 15 of how David began to make preparations this time for the ark to be returned. This time he was going to follow what God's word says. He saw what happened to Uzzah. He didn't want that to happen no more. So this time when the ark was returning, he was going to follow God's instructions carefully. But we got to understand again that God's purpose is to bless his people and not destroy them, not harm us. Yeah. So there's three, there's three truths I want us to grasp from this. And that is in verses 3 to 11. We're taught to reverence God's holiness. In verses 12 to 23, we're taught to rightly obey the Lord through the plain teaching of Scripture. It's called the regulative principle regarding worship. The regulative principle regarding worship. And the regulative principle regarding worship is simply that worship, worship, our worship, our gathering must be regulated or governed by the word of God. So the first R, rightly obey the Lord through the plain teaching of Scripture. That's the the regulative principle. Well, the first one was reverence God's holiness. The second one is rightly obey the Lord through the plain teaching of Scripture where we talked about the regulative principle. But then the third R is rejoice. Rejoicing before the Lord. So there's reverence Rightly obeying the Lord, rejoicing before the Lord. Because David dances before the ark. Yet we must realize that ultimately he was dancing before who? He was dancing before the Lord. Now whether or not dancing <laughs> was prescriptive or descriptive, it depends on what church you're in. I'm just yeah. saying. If you're in a Pentecostal church, they're going to tell you, yeah, I'm going to dance before the Lord. <laughs> if you're in a very conservative Baptist church, they're going to be like, what are you doing? <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think this is prescribing anything for us here, personally. But David dances before the Lord and David was wearing a linen ephod, which was a priestly function. He was wearing a linen ephod, this little piece right here, which was a, a priestly garment. And he was doing all kinds of priestly functions as well. And what we need to understand is David is a type of Christ. In that David is a king, Christ is a king. David was acting as a priest and Christ is a, or he is our priest. Christ is king, priest, and prophet. And as priest, Christ gave of himself on the cross to die for our sins. But back to this dancing. Because I don't believe David was dancing to draw attention to himself. A lot of the holy dancing we be seeing in churches yeah. today. Mm -hmm. now, I come out of a church <laughs> where folk holy dance. I mean, that's part of my roots. You know, we were we weren't Pentecostal, but we were Baptistical. <laughs> 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 so folk would holy dance. 
And you got some folk that with the holy dance, and you be like, mm, yeah, mm, nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, <yeah. laughs> we gonna have to pray for them. <laughs> so, and you know, you know, but I can't get into that right there. I can't, I can't, I can't get into that right there. But what we need to understand is we are the called people of God who gather each Lord's Day to celebrate what God has done for us each and every Sunday. And when we gather, worship is celebratory. It is uh, jubilant. It, you know, worship is not to be quiet and somber. I mean, sometimes you're going to come up in here on Sundays and you're going to walk out of here and you're going to feel on cloud nine. But then there's going to be some Sundays we're going to come out of here because the tone of the sermon, the, 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 the text drives the worship, not the music driving Amen. the worship. Amen. The text drives the worship. The scripture drives the worship. So there's going to be some Sundays where the text is going to be, you know, you're going to be like, yeah. I feel it. Amen. But then there's going to be some Sundays you walk out of here, you're going to be like, ouch. Man, he was stepping all on my bunions. That word was cutting deep today. I don't even feel high. I feel like I need to go home and put some more work in. Yeah. So, but either way, God is still worthy to be praised. But then I want us to Pay attention to this. And that's David's wife. We can ready to come to a close. David's wife, <laughs> Michal. She was Saul's daughter. Did you notice it says it three times that she was Saul's daughter? It says in verse 16, verse 20, and verse 23. And the question I had when I was looking at this was, why wasn't she celebrating too? I mean, it seems out of place, right? That everybody would be celebrating such a jubilant occasion. The Ark of the Covenant was coming back in, and this time nobody's dying. I mean, why is she celebrating? I got three observations, I believe, that points to the reason why she wasn't celebrating. And one is, as the text says, she was King Saul's daughter. She was the daughter of King David's rival. She was daughter of the man who wanted to kill King David. So what you got represented with Michael and David is two rival kingdoms. But number two, the second observation is uh, Michael and David were in a spiritual mismatch. They were unequally yoked. I reasoned in my own mind that she probably could not worship with David because she probably neglected worship Better yet, her, her private worship herself. She was more concerned about the outward appearances of worship. You know how folk God. Some folk come to church. They don't come to church to worship. They come to see what other folk are doing. <laughs> they come to watch what other folk are doing. And so when we come to worship, we don't come to see what everybody else is doing. We don't come to see if somebody going to sing our favorite song. We don't come to worship to see if somebody got on a better dress than us. Or a better suit than us. Or a better watch than us. Or better shoes than us, ladies. Or a better purse so we can be like, hmm. <laughs> We come to worship because we know who is present at 
like worship. Amen. Yahweh is present at worship. Jehovah is present at worship. Jesus is present at worship. And we don't come to be entertained. We come to perform for our God. Because when we come to worship, we come to perform for an audience of one. And so, the third observation about Michal is this. David may have been a poor husband too. You ever met people before who were giants in the public? I mean, giants in public, but midgets in regards to the marital fire embers burning at home. There's a part that I think we miss, and that is in the fifth chapter of 2 Samuel, verse 13, where it says, David took more concubines. and wives from Jerusalem and he came from Hebron. Michael was David's only woman. He had other wives and concubines. So the fire embers were not burning at home. David was bringing home Winter weather. But he probably wanted a summertime wife. And I want to tell the fellas <laughs> that if you want a summertime wife, you can't bring home winter weather. And so, because David was bringing home winter weather, his wife was cold in her communication to him. But you know what David reason? Well, she's not the only one. I got concubines and other wives. So David was a poor example of a husband. A man after God's own heart, indeed. But not an example of a good husband. And I say all that to say is is we can be giants in the public sphere. We can be giants in the eyes of those around us, but yet be poor in our family life. We can be giants in public worship, yet be poor in family worship. And so we've got to, as followers of Christ, order both our public and private worship. Because all of our worship, whether it be public or private, is ultimately before the Lord. Look how many times that shows up in the sixth chapter of 2 Samuel. Before the Lord. Before the Lord. Ultimately, all our worship is quorum deo, before the face of God. Psalm 24 says it this way. Who will ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And so, beloved, I want to encourage us all tonight to remember God's provision, God's presence. Remember the peril of not regarding God as holy. Also remember that God's purpose is to bless his people and not destroy his people. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord give you peace. Are there any questions? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you.
for your word tonight. We pray, Lord, that you help us to remember the truths that we have learned tonight. Help us, Lord, to order our public and private worship. Help us, Lord, to understand your provision for us each and every day. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you for protecting us. Help us to regard you, Lord, as being holy. Help us to understand, Lord, that your purpose is to bless us and not to destroy us. In Jesus' name, amen.